you got to be prepared to fail 99% of the time and you got to put yourself in that mindset if you don't then sometimes you cross to the dark side and that is really sad subject found is a series of found recordings from our extensive private collection it contains some of the most mysterious and macabre files and recordings ever gathered and we will release them for your consideration we do not validate their claims but share them to allow you to make up your mind about who we are and what our collective veritable truth actually is subject found is a bi-weekly audio drama each episode is sequential so if you haven't listened to the earlier episodes from this season we encourage you to do so now so you don't miss anything last episode jared strong met with local zoologist in tumwater washington to discuss the attraction of the natural habitat the pacific northwest provides various species including sasquatch this episode his investigation continues at one of washington state's most dominant natural features mount rainier I'm Jared Strong, and this is the second recording in the series I'm making to document my hunt for Sasquatch. Yesterday, I met with zoologist and friend Peter Beckingham, and hopefully the ecological and historical information he provided about this part of Washington State was helpful to listeners who aren't familiar with the area. Though most people familiar with Sasquatch won't have seen it as much of a revelation, I wanted to frame this investigation for people new to the topic so they can understand why Sasquatch has made the Pacific Northwest its home for at least as long as humans have been documenting their local giant apes. With that foundation established, I wanted to start exploring some of the evidence for Sasquatch's existence, but on my way to meet with Peter yesterday, I got a call from Andrew Porter, a park ranger at Mount Rainier National Park. 370 square miles of intense national beauty in the western half of the Evergreen State. Andrew asked me to come out because of a sighting. Recent history at Rainier isn't exciting. There hasn't been much activity out there. But there were a few reports he wanted me to be aware of. I think there might be more he's not sharing yet. Not sure why. But I can take a guess that whatever he has for me isn't something someone with a career wants to share over an open phone line. So I'm on my way out to the park now. I'll check back in as I get closer. Well, I just spoke with Andrew, and he's going to meet me at the ranger station next to the Henry M. Jackson Visitor Center. I hope I find a parking spot up there. If you've never been but plan on going, here's a piece of advice. Get there early, unless you don't mind walking around the mountain to get to the mountain. It takes forever to get through the park to this particular visitor center, which is about as close to the summit of Rainier as humanity has established itself. Any higher, and it's just you and the mountain the unforgiving mountain. I'm really looking forward to seeing what he has for me. I've never met Andrew, so I have no idea who he is, but he said he found me off the Facebook page. I didn't know anyone even looked at the page, so it was nice to find out that it served some purpose, wasting the precious little time I have to update the damn thing once in a while. (laughs) Well, I'm pulling up to the visitor's center now. I'll start recording again when I find Andrew. Andrew? I take it you're Jared. (laughs) That's me. Thanks for your time. Mind if I record this? Well, I did agree to it. Yeah, you did. I just wanted to make sure it was still okay with you, legalities and all that. Look, I get it. I'm sure you've got to be careful with that. I have to be careful with everything. Are you a believer? In Bigfoot? Hardly. But... You called me specifically because of something you've got? Something you think I need to see? Let's go to my office. I'd rather we talk there. (laughs) 
Would you like anything to drink? What do you have? Coffee and water. <laughs> Not much of a selection. Tight budget? Well, in the park we survive on coffee. It gets cold and boring out there. And the water? Eh, just to rehydrate. We don't have much in the way of medical expertise except what we can do for ourselves. So any way we delay or avoid needing medical help, we do it. Coffee would be great. And here you go. Thanks. So, what needs to happen for someone who doesn't believe in Sasquatch to call someone who is actively pursuing evidence for the existence of Sasquatch? Well, these. What's this? Reports. Our stations have taken in over the past few months from all around the mountain. All of these? There have to be... 75 reports. Didn't want you having to count all those. I appreciate it. This is strange. Sightings have been so rare out here for years. Well, what you've got in your hands disproves that. I'm not sure why, but these have been held back. Held back? Look, sorry, that's all above my pay grade. You should find a lot of information in those. I don't know what you can get from it, but I figured it'd be something useful to you. Some are sightings, some prints, some are crazier. What do you mean? Well, last week, some hikers claimed they came across Bigfoot. And they claim that they actually interacted with it. Which report is that? The report on top. I thought you'd want to see that one first. This is remarkable. <laughs> if it's real. You don't believe they saw this? I don't believe a large ape stopped to have a conversation with a group of hikers. No. This report doesn't say that. It says that... Look, I was being flippant. It's pretty remarkable, maybe too remarkable. How long have you worked the mountain? Man, it's been seven years. <laughs> I started working for the service right after college. But I've been here since. It's got to be a great job. That's all right. I mean, the mountain is great. It's beautiful. It's just... Not what you expected? <laughs> uh, no, no, not really. I think I sort of rushed myself into a career decision and figured I could make a bigger impact than I actually am. I've been hunting Sasquatch for 20 years. I can tell you that park services, rangers, forestry, all of you have made a very positive impact on the collective psyche about our natural resources. I don't want to think about where we'd be if it wasn't for people like you doing what you do. Thanks. You know, I, I think I had delusions of grandeur when I decided to follow this path. I don't know what I was thinking, but it it is what it is. I can't change that now. But if I'm able to help others, that's cool. I've made my peace with the fact that I'm not going to change the world. Don't lose that dream yet. You're young. Plenty of time to shake the world awake. Is that why you're reaching out to me now with these reports? Even if you don't believe Sasquatch exists? If this thing exists... And if these people are telling the truth, I don't want to stand in the way of truth. If these things are out there somewhere, it's my duty to the service to facilitate their study. You know, I did a lot of reading up on you. You're all over the internet and well-respected, at least by anyone who isn't a scientist, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I gave up caring about what they thought a long time ago. And it's got to be hard doing what you do. Depends on how you define hard. I enjoy it. It's a passion. It drives me, regardless of what doubters and naysayers think. And I appreciate people like you who put aside personal feelings about Sasquatch in order to help. Mind if I ask why you do this? I don't imagine it pays very well. No, money is the last of my considerations, trust me. My reasons are silly, to be honest, but... 
it is what it is. Childhood trauma has a way of doing that, of taking something that is pretty trivial and marking you in a way that drives you for the rest of your life. Hmm. You know, I get it. I mean, I didn't dream of being a park ranger when I was a kid. I wanted to be an astronaut. But I can understand what you're saying. I have friends who went through some really messed up stuff when we were kids, and it definitely makes them the adults they are today. Mind if I ask what happened? I mean, I'm sorry if that's inconsiderate. My supervisor keeps telling me I've got to be less direct with people. You know, my mother used to always say that too, but I thought she was just nitpicking, you know, like mothers can. I don't mean to be rude. Sorry. No, no, you're fine. I don't mind. But you've got to promise you won't laugh. Oh, Scout's honor. I didn't think park rangers were considered... Boy, in here, I thought I had a bad sense of humor. Huh? Oh, geez. Yeah, I missed that one. (laughs) What makes me do this? It's a long story. Covers most of my childhood and adolescence, in fact. I'll give you the short version. My family was a camping family, outdoorsy types. We'd camp all summer long, every other weekend at least. My father loved getting away from Seattle and back into nature. He grew up in a small town between Olympia and Portland and moved to Seattle for school and never left. He loved the city, we all did, but he had to get away from it from time to time. He used to say that camping allowed him to breathe again. We used to go to a campsite near Lake Cushman. It was my father's favorite place and it sort of became our home away from home because we went there so often. Are you familiar with it? You know, I can't say I've ever been out to the Olympics. I'm more of a Cascadia man myself. (laughs) Well, most of the sites are private with heavy coverage and undergrowth, so you really felt like you were away from the world, really out in the wild. The lake is tucked up against the southeast corner of Olympic National Park. Very picturesque, but also very private. You feel like you're on the edge of a vast wilderness, which, of course, you sort of are if you're looking in the right direction. My mother never got used to that isolation. Her and Dad used to get into some very interesting discussions, they would call them, about going out there. But she always went, complaining the whole way, only to talk about how much she enjoyed her weekend as we'd drive back to the city. There was one weekend where the forecast wasn't looking promising, but Dad said he really needed to get away, really needed to unplug. So we went, and the campground was nearly empty. Funny thing about Americans, isn't it? Even when we want to rough it, we need perfect conditions to do so. Oh man, that is so true. (laughs) Yeah, I guess you would know that. So we were enjoying the site, enjoying the peace that comes with a nearly vacant campsite, and just unwinding. We woke up Saturday morning and headed down to the lake to do some kayaking and swimming. When we came back to the campsite hours later, it was destroyed. Your campsite was destroyed. It looked like a group of drunk teens came through and tore everything up. Our coolers were thrown across the site. The fire pit looked like something had run through it, tossing ash everywhere. One of our tents had been yanked from the ground and was shredded. We tried to salvage all the food we had and set camp back up again. My father was irate. Mother asked him if we could leave, but it was getting late and he'd been up late the night before and enjoying the evening. He didn't think we could make it back safely, and he was sure it was just stupid kids, he said. Mom wasn't too happy about that. It was a long night. We were quiet all evening as we ate and tried to distract ourselves with card games. My dog, a six-year-old collie, was being ridiculous. His name was Sam, and he just wouldn't lie down. just kept pacing. It annoyed the hell out of me. We tried to settle in by watching the fire for hours. As a young kid, I don't remember everything, but I do remember just wanting to go to bed and get the night over. So I did, but not before my mother asked my father to keep the fire hot. They argued a bit because he didn't want to be up late and she didn't want to be without the fire and the safety it provided. It was obvious she was scared. I didn't understand why, but I could feel it from her. She was usually so steady. I don't know how long I'd been sleeping when Sam started whining. He always slept in the tent with me. 
It was a three-person tent, but with all my gear and clothes and Sam inside, it was a pretty tight fit. His fidgeting bugged the hell out of me. I remember telling him to lie down, but he kept standing up and whimpering. He was looking towards the tent flap and pacing in any sliver of space he could find. It was late, though I'm not sure how late. Suddenly Sam started losing his mind, whimpering like I was beating him. Then all of a sudden he laid down, his head between his paws, and got real quiet. I had this sudden fear. I didn't want to move. I didn't want to turn my flashlight on. I was frozen, not daring to make a sound. To this day, I don't know why I felt like that. I just did. I laid there and didn't move a muscle except to reach for Sam. I thought I was trying to comfort him, but now I know I was really trying to comfort me. That's when I heard the growl. There was something outside my tent. I could hear it moving, grunting, and, and it tossing our stuff around. My parents unzipped their tent, a flashlight came on, and my father started yelling. Years later, he told me he was trying to scare the camp invader. Did it work? Not at all. All at once, the camp went from silent to absolute chaos. My father was yelling, my mother was screaming, and whatever was out there howled. It was ungodly. That howl. I'll, I'll never forget that sound. I had to unzip my tent. I had to get out. It, I felt trapped. Like whatever was out there was going to discover me and I'd have nowhere to run. I figured if I was out of the tent, at least I could escape. Childish, I know. There was so much commotion outside, I couldn't get my tent unzipped quickly enough. The zipper kept getting stuck because I was shaking so badly. My mother, my mother kept screaming. I finally got the tent unzipped and Sam bolted out. I, I reached for him, but oh, once he had his mind set on something, that was it. I scrambled after him, not thinking about anything else, but my mother grabbed me before I ran more than a few feet. She was hysterical. I was little. I wasn't going to break free. She made sure of that. Even as dark as it was, I could make out enough of what was going on because my father had his flashlight and a lantern in the dirt, and it lit up enough of the sight. Enough to see our visitor. You never forget the first time you see a Sasquatch. Wait, you saw one of them? <laughs> Everyone's a skeptic until they see a Sasquatch. From that day on, we all believe. My father was waving his arms wildly, using his tactical flashlight like it was a damn lightsaber. The Sasquatch was on the edge of the site near where we'd left our cooler. I remember it looking bewildered. It must have been trying to figure out what the hell my father was. That's when I noticed Sam. He may have been frightened initially, but not now. He was a completely different dog. His hackles were raised as he stood between my father and the Sasquatch. Crouched down on his front paws, he was ready to pounce. The Sasquatch was growling, but so was Sam. That damn dog just wouldn't back down. It didn't matter that the Sasquatch was ten times his size. Sam was not letting that thing harm us. I remember hearing other campers coming, complaining about some stupid college kids. But when a few of the men stomped into our site, ready to give us a piece of their mind, they saw that thing and immediately... I've never seen grown men collectively cower. Sam was barking viciously, maybe feeling emboldened by the presence of a small army of humans. <sighs> Whether it was Sam's increased aggression or the fact that all these people... I, I don't know, but the Sasquatch suddenly turned and leapt into the trees. That's when Sam went after him. <laughs> that little bastard had so much fight in him. My mother wouldn't let go of me no matter how much I struggled. 
I fought, I cried, but she wouldn't let me go. She knew what my young mind was thinking. My father knelt in front of me and assured me Sam would be back any minute. I could hear his barking becoming more distant as he chased that thing through the forest. And I kept waiting for him to turn around. He didn't, though. Just before his barking completely faded, I heard him yelp. And then, nothing. No one was going into those woods. I can understand it now, of course, but as a kid, I hated all those men and my own father for being cowards and not saving Sam. The next morning, the campground staff called in rangers, and they found him after a few hours of searching. I was an adult before my father would tell me the truth about what happened. For years, he told me Sam had apparently fallen into a pit and broke his neck, dying suddenly, that he'd felt no pain. But when I was older and my parents thought I was ready to hear the truth, my father let me know what the rangers had actually found. Dad said it horrified them. I guess they said it looked like something had torn Sam in half and just discarded him on the forest floor. And that's what set me on this course, believe it or not. I told you it was stupid. No, 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 I, I get it. You were young, and, uh, and honestly, dogs are pretty cool. I'm not much of a cat person. <laughs> they make a lousy terrible company <laughs> hey this you know this this might be good news for you then but uh those reports they're they're not all that i have for you oh it, yeah and um you know if you like i can uh i can take you up to the site where these people saw the sasquatch no where i did Over the past 20 years, I've seen a lot of conversions. Seeing a Sasquatch will change the hearts of even the most staunch skeptics. But Andrew was especially guarded. Understandably so. I wanted to carefully manage my reaction. He was young, young enough to be worried about protecting his career options. I've come to know plenty of rangers and forest service personnel, and I can tell you that they are just like the rest of us, a mix of principled skeptics and unabashed believers. There are also people with responsibilities, car payments, and mortgages. And admitting to something like this would need to be done with caution, at least for those who valued their career. Now that I know this part of his personal mystery, I'm very glad I accepted his invitation. Convert stories are some of the most powerful evidence for anthropologists, zoologists, cryptozoologists, and hunters of Sasquatch like me. I couldn't wait to see what he had to show me. I wasn't sure if Andrew bought my story about Sam or not. I've recited it enough times over the years, at public gatherings, in Bigfoot enthusiast groups, and even to curious strangers to make it believable. Or at least I think I have. But some people are very perceptive. Maybe that was why he shared as much as he did with me. But if Andrew saw through my veneer, he was kind enough not to say anything. For now... I'm going to shut down this recording and get it packaged for you. When I'm done tonight, I'm going to have a cold beer in honor of Sam. All quotes that you hear at the beginning of each episode are provided by Steve Mojo Wilkins of the Washington Sasquatch Research Team. You can find more of Steve's work over at WASRT.net. And I would like to thank Steve for his time on educating me on what it's like to find Bigfoot. Subject Found is a Paul Sighting production in association with Fate Crafter Studios. This episode was written and edited by Paul Sating. It was produced by Brian Bristol. Join us in episode 3 as Jared wraps up his visit at Mount Rainier with Andrew and then responds to a sighting out in Forks, Washington. We will also look at the etymology and zoology of Sasquatch, so be sure to join in. If you have any sightings you would like to report, 
please email us at foundtapespodcast at gmail.com and we'll make sure we get it into Jared's hands. You can find more information about Subject Found at foundstories.com. Also, check out some of the other Fate Crafter shows, such as Diary of a Madman at madmandiary.com, Atheist Apocalypse at atheistapocalypse.com, and the You Are Here podcast at youareherepodcast.com. John McLean is Jared Strong. You can find more of John's work over at jmacvo.com and at dogandponystudios.net. David Curry plays Andrew Porter. You can find David on his YouTube show, This Atheist Life, and on the Atheist Apocalypse podcast. Music in this episode was licensed to use with permission and was created by Chris Collins at IndieMusicBox.com. If you would like to become a patron of Subject Found so that we can continue this investigation into this season's lost tapes and to bring you more newly discovered tapes in the future, you can, and we appreciate it, by going over to patreon.com forward slash Paul Sading, P-A-U-L-S-A-T-I-N-G. Each and every gesture of support is truly, truly appreciated. And there's also some cool benefits in there for you. Lastly, go over to foundstories.com and find out how you can subscribe to the show so you don't miss a single episode. And while you're out on the internet, why not leave a rating and review for the show? We love those five-star ratings. They go a long way toward the show being found by other people who might enjoy it as well. And it's a nice way to help the show out. We really appreciate when people do take time to go do that for us. Until episode three, remember, all that is lost must be found.